right. Thank you for our, attending our webinar today, Artificial Intelligence and its Implications for the Present and Future of Historical Research, which is part of the AHA Colloquium series of Virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I'd like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the association, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of the conversation today. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions for the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but also need to be mindful of the time so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on our YouTube channel in the future. I'll now turn things over to the chair of the session today, Daryl Meadows, an independent scholar and um, from the National Publications and Records Commission. Thank you. I thank you so much, Debbie. And um, it's a genuine pleasure to be involved in this roundtable discussion, and I'm honored to serve as its chair. Uh, this roundtable brings together scholars and practitioners in the subfields, uh, from subfields within and adjacent to the discipline of history to consider the epistemological, methodological, and pedagogical implications of artificial intelligence systems on historical practice. In conceiving this roundtable, my colleague, Josh Sternfeld, who's with us today, uh, and I did so really out of a sense of urgency and with the hope that through this conversation, uh, we might stimulate more reflection and more interdisciplinary conversation on a topic uh, which we believe to be of vital uh, importance to the present and future work of historians, the historical profession, and the humanities writ large. Um, for Josh and myself, uh, as employees of the federal government, uh, I want to state that our remarks are entirely our own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the federal government. Um, as a group, uh, we have been working together over much of the past year via email on a version of this roundtable, which was recently invited for consideration by the American Historical Review for its new section devoted to history's evolving missions in the digital age, organized by consulting editor for digital history, Lara Putnam. So stay tuned for that as well. Uh, since this is the first time all of us have actually met face to face, even virtually, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to see all of you here together in this space. Um, and to all of you who took time out of your busy schedules to join us, thank you for your interest and participation in this conversation. Uh, I've asked each of our panelists to offer opening remarks of about five or six minutes each, uh, which should leave us plenty of time for q and I will follow up with one or two questions of my own, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, please do uh, submit your questions in the chat at any point. Uh, and we'll try to respond to as many of those as we can within the allotted time. And now it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce this outstanding panel. Uh, Matthew Jones is the James R. Barker Professor of Contemporary Civilization at Columbia University. Kate Crawford is a Research Professor of Communication and STS at USC Annenberg, a Senior Pr Principal Researcher at Microsoft Research, and the inaugural Visiting Chair for AI and Justice at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, France. Meredith Broussard is an associate professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute of New York University and research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. Ben Schmidt is a clinical associate professor in the Department of History and Director of Digital Humanities at New York University. And Joshua Sternfeld is an independent scholar in digital history uh, and currently also serving as senior program officer for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Lauren Tilton is an assistant professor of digital humanities at the University of Richmond and director of the visiting of the distant viewing lab. Um, we will take a sort of round robin approach here, both in the presentations and the Q&A. So um, presenters will do so in the order introduced. Uh, and then as we uh, have follow up questions, we will also take responses in that same order. So Matt, it's up to you. Take it away. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to begin uh, by talking about a uh, sort of classic moment where someone resists the imposition of the quantitative onto, uh, onto uh, our humanistic field and denounces the idea of sciences that involving human beings um, might be that might those might reduce to elegant mathematics um, and the paper actually calls for someone to stop acting all of us to stop acting with our goal is to author extremely elegant theories and instead embrace complexity now many of you may know this paper actually then calls for not say a new hermeneutics but quite quite differently, what they call the best ally they have for understanding the complexity of humanistic society, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. And this is a paper that emerged uh, out of Google um, some years ago. Now, why I find this so interesting, because it captures something so important about the current moment in AI, the way the current moment in AI, in distinction to much of the earlier moment uh, in AI, um, was is, is, is very much something deeply concerned with highly granular data and particularly highly granular data about people, precisely in some sense, the domain of those of us in the humanistic and humanistic social sciences. And as uh, many of the people on this panel have written about so eloquently, AI has really dramatically changed in the last couple of years into, um, it, 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 into something that was no longer about symbolic reasoning, but is much more about predictive machine learning on, on high dimensional data sets. Um, and this empirical granularity is precisely as I think probably everyone here knows and has been so eloquently written about by so many commentators. The reason that predictive algorithms that memorize too much reproduce in structural ways precisely the structural inequalities of our society. And there's the dumpster fire. So what we see, of course, is a disruption of massive forms of, of traditional expertise, including those of us in the room, as it were, who are doing history. And it's very much a moment in which an old binary between the sciences and the humanities, real world and academic research are not to be, to be found. The binary here is the, new, the, 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 the threat in some sense of new forms of machine learning on extremely large data sets that challenge old competencies, but they challenge us as historians in some sense by being precisely about the granular form and the great data scientist Hannah Wallach wrote about this many years ago. So, I'm supposed to be short and I promise I'll do that. So what kind of histories do we need? This is the fundamental thing that as historians one needs to be wondering. Well, we clearly need a rich thicket of histories. And some of them people on this panel have begun producing. And particularly, I want to argue, we need to have a thicket of history with practitioners that are fruitfully at odds. And what I mean by that is that we need to have the whole range of different kinds of historical practitioners who prioritize things differently in order to get into the level of density and argumentation that is essential if what it is to, we want to do is to excavate the conditions under which the moment we find ourselves um, are to be illuminated. We need historians emphasizing the social, the economic, the cultural, the technological, and indeed the intellectual history. And here, this is too many words on a slide, but a sense of the range of a remarkable history that people are doing right now. And if anyone wants the bibliography, but it ranges from everything from the history of privacy by Sarah Igo, to infrastructures of recording, to the provision of rare earth elements, to neo-colonial neo data extraction and class classic labor histories about de-skilling. It involves this group of people and many more, including the people on this panel that I didn't include. What we need is precisely then a range of historical competencies precisely to understand, as is our vocational demand, to understand why these large scale algorithmic decision systems are, 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 are not necessarily so. Now, the other thing I want to say is that this history is itself important if what we want to understand is the utility of using these new sorts of machine learning techniques and associated techniques in history. That the history of data and its excavation in the ways I just, is cr crucially important to using history reflexively using that data. 
Now, that Google slide I started with uh, began by calling for a new granular kind of approach. But it involves a kind of naive positivism that many people here will know very well. In the past, epistemological crises in history have meant rejecting a naive positivism, but doing so by getting technical to become better critical. And here's Mabillon's uh, book on diplomatics that helped solve the epistemological crisis of documents at the end of the 17th century. It is precisely that that I think as historians we need to, we need to do. We, need, we too, need to turn infrastructures of data collection and analysis upside down. Indeed, I would suggest that there's a particular centrality that we can play, which is both critical and productive, and that I hope we will continue to do so. Um, I'll give a plug for one thing, is that I've been very involved in a, uh, a program uh, at, at, centered at Cambridge um, called Histories of Artificial Intelligence and Genealogy of Power. We still have some events going through into the summer, and I can't recommend it to you enough. I'll end there in the interest of time. So I believe it's my turn to go next, and, and I'd like to begin with a couple of acknowledgements. First, uh, to Matt for that absolutely stellar way to kick off our discussion today. Um, second, to Daryl for bringing together this group of scholars. It's been such a pleasure to be working with you remotely and a delight to have us all together today. And then thirdly, uh, to note the lands where I'm joining you from, which is the uh, Gadigal lands and the Eora Nation. And I want to acknowledge the traditional leaders past, present and future. So in terms of um, joining in on this question of what is it to historicize artificial intelligence and where do we draw the limits around it? I, I want to begin by noting that this is a notoriously hard question that people have struggled with for a long time, certainly over the 65 years that the term artificial intelligence has been in being. This is partly because the term itself is slippery. It can be a technical method, an infrastructure, a set of social practices, an industry, and a way of seeing. It's also a manifestation of highly organized capital backed by systems of extraction, logistics, and complex supply chains. In fact, just recently, I was watching an extraordinary lecture by the computer scientist Hal Abelson, who was speaking in 1986 at MIT, and he begins his lecture with a giant chalkboard behind him. Two words are written on it, computer and science. He begins by crossing out the word science and saying, this is not a science, it's a set of practices. And then he turns and says, neither is it about computers. It's actually about something much more complex than that. It's how we instantiate these systems. I would begin also by saying here that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligent. So what does it mean to try and track this more complex set of ways of knowing and being? Well, part of this issue, I think, is to track the multiple domains upon which these histories can be threaded together. And here, I think I will be echoing some of the points that Matt has just raised, but allow me to note five. There are, of course, technical aspects, and many histories of AI as a technical field have focused on a small set of, sadly, predominantly male pioneers with all of the problems that we might have with that term, and a focus on methods, algorithms, and abstract computational approaches. But of course, these systems are anything but abstract. They are physical infrastructures designed by people with material histories that shape their operations and political economies. So how do we contend with these and widen the horizon of inquiry? Well, fortunately, there are excellent examples of many scholars already doing this work. On the side of labor, we might think of the labor histories of the women who were the original computers, documented by people like Jennifer Light, Ma Hicks, and the role of crowd workers, researched by Mary Gray, Sid Suri, and Sarah Roberts. We might think of the material aspects. Uh, here I might mention something like Nicole Staroslewski's book, The Undersea Network, the cables that snake around the planet that allow AI at scale to occur. Or of course, the history of classification so ably presented by scholars like Jeff Bowker and Susan Lee Starr. We might think of the data aspects, how data practices have shifted industrial labs in the 20th century, seen in the work of scholars like Stephanie Dick, Chao Cheng Li, and Mara Mills in her work on optical character recognition in Bell Labs. And of course, there are stunning political histories by scholars such as Paul Edwards and Eden Medina. But certainly, part of what I think we need to do next is to continue to 
of course, dig into the, uh, into the layers of how AI is built. And of course, Matt has used the word excavation, and I'm going to echo that here. And um, certainly through a, a couple of moments of my own personal experience of trying to historicize the materiality of AI. Here, I'm going to give a specific shout out to the need for work in the area of training data. Training sets, of course, are the substrates of contemporary machine learning systems, and they're central to how AI systems recognize and interpret the world and shape the epistemic boundaries governing how they operate. But they are so rarely studied. They're just seen as infrastructures to be applied to create and test models. For example, I could mention here the Enron corpus, which has been cited in thousands of academic papers, but rarely looked at closely. Nathan Heller has described it as the canonical research text that no one has actually read. And I want to say this is partly because they're so hard to read. Training sets are disorderly texts, which are monstrous in scale. And I learned this from first principles in a multi-year project called Excavating AI with the artist Trevor Paglen. It was like a journey through a Borgesian nightmare. Uh, we worked specifically on ImageNet, that colossus of image recognition, which contains a profusion of 14 million images. Some are high resolution stock photography, others are blurry phone photographs, some are cartoons, some a pornography it is a mad jumble um, but of course part of what makes this difficult is that these are data sets that are structured for computers to see rather than for humans to study and all of these images are hand labeled by crowd workers and this is of course why labor histories too are so important here Training sets, of course, have their own history, from the few dozens of images that were collected in the early work of Woody Bledslow to the Department of Defense sponsored a ferret collection of over 14,000 portraits in the 1990s to the megafauna of Clear AI's collection of 3 billion images scraped from the internet in the 2020s. And of course, these training sets build on each other. They are genealogies of data that carry their particularities and skews and historical specificities with them. ImageNet, created in 2009, was imported from WordNet, which was created in 1985, which contains a subset of the Brown Corpus, which was first published in 1961. Each of these corpuses are infused fused with politics and they build upon each other. Um, for us, the experience of opening sets and finding images of contemporary people labeled as slattens or trollops or ladies maids or washerwomen certainly is a reminder of how concepts that are offensive or have fallen into disuse can live on unexamined like ghosts in the machine. But these specters continue to influence the work of AI systems in the world. So I'll simply end here by asking what lessons can we learn? And I think certainly one of the, the lasting experiences that I've had doing this kind of work is the way in which we can only understand the deeper operations of how systems are made by doing precisely these kinds of excavations and these questions across multiple fields. By doing this, we can look to the larger costs of these systems, their environmental and labor legacies, all along the supply chains of industrial computation. So for historians, using AI tools in their own work, new questions might follow. How did this system get produced? What are its histories, skews, and particularities? What undeclared, undeclared freight, if you will, might it be carrying in terms of its inbuilt perspectives? And what might it leave out? Who worked on these systems and what institutional forces are in play? These are the material histories that invoke the epistemic machinery in Corinne Nor Satina's words. And they directly engage with the historical ways of seeing and knowing that AI systems bring along with them. And I'll pause there. Thank you. All right, Kate, thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that I really like about what you said was the idea that uh, everybody means something different when they say AI. Uh, and so doing AI is sometimes about hardware, sometimes it's about software, sometimes it's about a way of seeing, uh, sometimes it's talking about weird stuff from Hollywood movies. Uh, the term AI is very slippery. Uh, and that's kind of the foundation of what I want to talk about today. Um, so I would echo your thanks to the organizers uh, for bringing us all together around this topic. 
Uh, I am going to speak in uh, sound bites. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm going to give you a bunch of sound bites from uh, my contribution to the AHR interchange. Um, and Victor, if you can just uh, tell me in the chat if my, uh, if my slides are showing up okay. Uh, the big problem that I want to start with uh, when it comes to AI and history is that the digital world is more fragile than most people realize. Uh, a lot of the conversation around history and AI is about, oh, we're going to use all of this fantastic data that's being generated and we're going to gather it into a corpus and we're going to do AI on it and that's going to replace uh, other methods, and in the future, uh, we're just going to use AI methods here and there, which is a really nice fantasy, but uh, the digital world is extremely, extremely fragile. Uh, I have been writing for the internet since about 1996, and all of my early stuff is gone. It only exists in printouts, in archival sleeves, in a box in my office. So they told us the internet was forever, but that was a lie. What are the implications for historians? Well, if journalism is the first draft of history, then historians should be very, very worried because what's happening is that uh, there are holes in the historical record when it comes to preserving journalism. One of the research questions that I've been working on for the past couple of years is the question of how will historians read today's news on tomorrow's computers? Uh, because when we read news on a computer, it is about hardware and software working together. If you preserve today's news on say a CD, well, in 10 years, nobody's going to have a CD drive. I actually had to purchase a CD drive recently uh, in order to uh, in order to read some image files that had been sent to me and somehow they couldn't be sent to me electronically. They had to be mailed on a CD and I did not have the capacity to read it. So you have to think about the hardware that is required in order to do, uh, like in order to retrieve the information that we theoretically wanna do AI on. AI depends on a huge amount of data uh, if you imagine that there is a news data set that is being accumulated, uh, you are wrong. It is actually extremely incomplete. And what kind of news is being preserved in these, uh, in these massive digital archives that we can access through university libraries or uh, that we can access online? Well, it's the news from well-resourced media companies. And that news is being privileged in the digital historical record. So when it comes to say potential bias in historical data sets, well, we know that there is a bias already toward the extremely well-resourced media organizations and smaller media organizations, digital first media organizations, uh, black owned media organizations uh, are all disadvantaged in terms of who gets represented in the digital historical record. If you're interested in reading more about the history of loss in news archiving, uh, maybe you're horrified hearing this, uh, and I would love for you to get activated around the issue. Uh, I recommend a book called Future Proofing the News, Preserving the First Draft of History by Kathleen Hansen and Nora Paul. Uh, big ideas that you'll want to take away from this uh, are that archiving problems exist for print, broadcast, and born digital news. There are holes in all of these archives, but new media formats are particularly vulnerable. I think about this as a data journalist because one of the things that I do is I build I, I build artificial intelligence in order to commit acts of investigative reporting. I build news apps, I try and build using the most innovative techniques out there. And these techniques, these digital artifacts that uh, data journalists are creating uh, are impossible to preserve in current digital archives. And this leads to major gaps in the historical record. 
big idea here is that cutting edge digital news is disappearing. What does this look like? Well, go back and look at the major news events from uh, years ago. Here is something from 1997, a Philadelphia Inquirer story called Black Hawk Down by Mark Bowden, uh, which was also turned into a movie. Here's what it looks like. And none of the video or audio or photos that are linked on the left work anymore. And so the lesson for historians is that if you imagine that you're going to be able to compute on these large swaths of data in the future and that you're going to be able to depend on the archives, it's not necessarily true. And also you can't compute on what isn't preserved in the archives. Now, when I talk about this, usually at this point, somebody says, but what about the Internet Archive? Doesn't the Internet Archive preserve everything? And my response is that the Internet Archive is really great. The Internet Archive is doing heroic work. Librarians are doing heroic work to try and preserve digital news uh, so that we can read it in the future. But there are technical limitations. And so if you ask the Internet Archive or you ask any a digital archivist, they will tell you that static sites are easier to preserve than dynamic sites. So let's take a look at something from ProPublica. This is a ProPublica story called How Much Is a Limb Worth? This was a really innovative uh, ProPublica examination of uh, different compensation levels for on-the-job injuries in different states. Uh, and so it's an interactive piece. And what we have up on the screen here uh, is a shot of the ProPublica story. And we see that the average maximum comp compensation for one arm in the USA is $169,878. Now let's look at what it looks like preserved in the Internet Archive. You can see that we have some of the text but we don't have any of the images and we don't have the drop downs. And then we have some more text that is divorced from context. So something is being preserved, but it doesn't make any sense. So if we were to go and take this, uh, take this archive unexamined, as, uh, as the previous commenters have mentioned, if we were to just take this archive and dump it into a training data set and train uh, algorithms on it, it would be nonsensical, right? So we have to pay attention to what's happening underneath, how these data sets are being constructed, also how the data sets are being preserved, who is preserving them, and exactly what is going into them. So one of the goals that I have is to create a scholarly archive of digital journalism, uh, primarily focused on digital first dynamic news objects. And I will end with the idea that archiving digital content is a human in the loop process. Often we fantasize that it's going to be possible to uh, have these archival processes run automatically, that we're going to be able to write algorithms that are going to go out there and scrape the web and capture the history and put it into a database and it's just going to be there when we need it and we're going to be able to do our computations on it and it's going to be seamless and efficient and sleek. And that is a wonderful fantasy. I would love it if it actually worked like that, but it is not. Uh, AI is really nifty, but it is not a complete solution. So when we're thinking about AI and history and the interplay between AI and history, we need to think about what is being preserved. We need to think about what do we mean by AI. We need to think about the methods of preservation. We need to think about what goes into the training data set. And we need to think of this as a very human historical process. Thank you. I believe Ben is up next. All right. Um, 
so yes, thank you for coming and, uh, and thanks to all my fellow panelists and especially thank you to Daryl and the HA staff for, for helping lead us through this difficult time for, for being merciful and prodding because I've, because I've failed to meet many deadlines uh, over the last year. Um, as I think about what the impact of AI is gonna be on historical research, the framework that I've been bringing to it is the one that Lara Putnam laid out in her 2016 article in the AHR about the transnational and the text searchable, which made a really interesting argument about the kind of unacknowledged ways that full text search, even if it didn't like cause the boom in transnational history in the 90s and the 2000s, at least made it a lot easier for it to take a particular form. And at the same time, left historians with a really sort of impoverished investment in the country's periods and people that they studied. Um, the perspective that I think we got to think about when we think about AI is that the most important changes brought about are most likely to be ones that we're largely not going to notice ourselves, except for a sort of general sense of a confirmation of the superpowers that we historians all have as researchers and unearthers of documents and creators of arguments. It's going to be one where the underlying methods that we apply align really nicely with the tools that Google and Elsevier and JSTOR are developing, and that we may not always notice when we're using them, and that we may not notice right now when we're using them. And most importantly, that we will not notice while, that while we are increasing our own powers of historical research, others are gaining them for the first time in much more sophisticated ways than in the days when historians more or less had an archive, uh, sorry, a monopoly on seats in the archive. But there is a difference between search and AI, which is the types of discovery and research that it facilitates. So I wanna sort of take it on myself to go a little bit deeper into what the algorithms are and aren't. As a lot of people have said AI itself is a sort of term that almost uh, everybody coming at this from the humanities side has a certain level of squeamishness with because it is like a kind of philosophical goal that has never really existed that blends together machine learning and data science and neural nets. Um, what one of the practitioners in the data science program at NYU calls it, which I find really useful for thinking about, is representation learning, which is a really recent shared strategy that has quickly transformed information architecture in all sorts of fields in the last decade. Representation learning is sort of a general strategy for taking any type of digital object, whether it's a book, whether it's your listening history, whether it's a history of all of the things that you've read in your Zotero archive and turning it into a vector of numbers that positions every artifact that it encounters in a high dimensional space um, that turns it into three in one dimension and two in another dimension and six in another, usually like, you know, 50 to 1,000 elements long. Modern representation learning algorithms use neural networks, which are sort of increasingly poorly named. And here I'm going to share not a full slideshow, but a couple images that I think are useful, um, which are sometimes depicted this way, which I find to be completely useless. Um, and sort of underlines the sense that these are networks that we're working with, which I think kind of misleads people about what they are, which is that deep learning is in general, representation learning is in general, just a series of sort of tiered representations where somebody starts with a picture of a car and turns it into a different representation and turns it into a different representation, ending in one of those high dimensional spaces and then making a prediction from it. But what's really important about this is not the predictions that you make at the end, but the idea of placing things in a custom generated space that situates all the elements in a training set and an archive and a corpus into a place where they're all positioned relative to each other. And this works on all sorts of different um, all sorts of different architectures. It works on trying to understand language. It works also on trying to understand, excuse me, I'm out of order. Um, it also works on trying to understand images. Now, the question that I think we have to ask is what are the effects of this type of learning likely to be in the historical profession over the next 15 to 20 years? And how does that differ from the way that search has in unacknowledged and still unacknowledged ways transformed historical research? And I think there are two things we really need to think about. One is that it makes search operate both on new kinds of sources and on new kinds of terms. 
Um, it lets us search not just text, but search things like imaging, images, it lets us search things like handwriting. Um, it makes foreign language translation considerably easier to a modicum of practicality. And if there's one thing that I think historians have not thought nearly seriously enough about yet, it's why we're still making students do foreign language exams, saying they can use a dictionary for it, but obviously they can't use Google Translate as if that bears any resemblance to the sort of situations that you're likely to have as a historian working from their home in a pandemic with full access to all sorts of machine translation tools, not just dictionaries. The other thing that it does is it blurs the line between search and recommendation systems in really interesting but really problematic ways. If you search for not just a term, but a trajectory, a set of all the books that you've read. One of the things that makes Spotify and Google and the rest work so well is that they don't just reduce songs to vectors, but they reduce users to vectors as well. And one of the challenges that we're gonna face is that we increasingly get research that's gonna be tailored towards what the scholar wants to see, um, which too often historians dissemble as meaning easy to use or straightforward or not complicated, but which actually can often mean fitting their preconceptions. One last point, which I think I've got time to make, or sorry, two last points, um, but the one that I'm deciding not to cut on the fly is this. Um, sometimes people think computers are binary and talking to an honest of historians, one thing I think is really important to underline is that computers, although they use bits somewhere in some metal that nobody who even programs computers ever really has to worry about outside of like an electrical engineering class that they take their second year, uh, an exaggeration, but not an insane exaggeration. Um, they are not actually binary in these new representation learning systems. Instead, they can actually only see in shades of gray. They only make predictions which are probabilistic. They are pathologically incapable of determining that something is fully one thing or fully another thing. And the way that they deal with things like genre and classification is to present it as an area of blur lines, blurred lines. When I'm writing about the Library of Congress classification for which I use AI, I give it Moby Dick and the model is fairly confident that it's reading a novel and that it's probably either American juvenile literature or American adult literature, but it also holds out a reasonable chance that it, maybe it's biology or travel literature. And it even gives a little chance that maybe it's a mathematical treatise or a musical score or something in Arabic. Um, that is gonna be exciting for historians as we go onwards, but it's also gonna be dangerous because it pre-confirms some of our assumptions, which we are both most attached to and which are gonna be the least useful to the rest of the academy and the rest of our field, um, and sorry, and the rest of the, of the broader cultural conversation. Um, I worry that we're gonna overestimate our relevance as we come to see how biased the uh, sources are and as we come to think about what it means to create uh, these large textual sets. And instead, what we're going to become is people who look at the things which are actually being surfaced by machine learning algorithms and think that we have been the ones to create and find them ourselves and to not properly understand why we are seeing what we're seeing. In one project that I work on with Peter Organisak about library about different types of books. We have one notebook that we maintain, which is called the Menagerie. It's a place where the classification system that we created completely breaks down because we've encountered books in the Hathi Trust Digital Library that do things that we didn't know books could do before, where the publisher accidentally printed the same page 10 times in a row and bound them together against each other, where the pages are interleaved backwards relative to each other, where Google, like, you know, mirror image the pages while it was scanning. Things like that happen. It screws up our algorithm and they get surfaced and presented to us. One of the things that I think is gonna happen more and more as we switch from keyword search to these new discovery searches is that we are going to become more and more often confronted with those types of examples uh, with these menageries, with these strange beasts. And we're gonna come to overrepresent their significance and their commonness. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years is that economists and other professions, uh, including uh, people in, in English literature, have much more often come to use these kinds of tools to try to write large picture histories of the past. My fear about the historical profession and AI is that 
because we are, unlike economists, unlike computer scientists, and unlike English professors, not very good at focusing purely on methodology and instead want to actually write history all of the time, um, perhaps understandably, we are not going to be nearly as good at finding ways to tell these narratives that are interesting generated by these new sources and instead are going to become sort of zookeepers of the strange elements of the past which will confirm our uh, favorite narratives that all classifications are wrong that all people are interesting and that all documents are unique and special so i think that uh, brings the group to me. I just wanted to thank uh, thank all my panelists. These talks are so exciting and so stimulating. I know I've uh, got so many ideas that I want to take back to my own work. And of course, I want to thank uh, Daryl for wrangling all of us uh, over these many months and uh, and the AHA for, for hosting this virtual colloquium. So how will we write the histories of 2020? Uh, any number of topics will require historicizing AI systems embedded within socio-political, economic, and cultural structures. Histories of the social justice protest movement uh, cannot ignore predictive policing and facial recognition surveillance systems, nor can an examination of the stresses placed upon our political system overlook the polarizing effects caused by the relentless barrage of misinformation by social media feeds. And we wouldn't be on the cusp of reopening our society amidst a debilitating pandemic if it weren't for the miraculous discovery in a matter of days of highly effective vaccines. Historicizing AI systems, as others on this colloquium uh, skillfully acknowledge, requires examining a network of human-machine relations, interwoven contexts marked by decisions, actions, and reactions over time. What distinguishes AI human networks from other technological networks is an AI system's capacity to change over time, thanks to machine learning's propensity for modification. I propose that we cannot adequately historicize our contemporary era without also acknowledging AI systems as historical entities, that is, beings actively interpreting or historicizing the past. Training data sets are an AI system's primary source material, which uh, my colleague, Dr. Crawford, really, uh, ably pointed out, and its algorithm uh, carefully calibrated by humans, the method by which it contextualizes data. The outputs generated by the system represent an interpretation of that contextualized data. I would like to briefly outline the concept of AI as historian, which I argue introduces a framework for understanding AI that may seem both familiar and foreign to historians. AI systems, like historians, are trained to contextualize through an analysis of historical evidence, which introduces several layers of bias embedded within the AI system itself, as well as the data with which it engages. But how we historicize such bias is a complex affair. Historicizing AI systems requires identifying the spatial, temporal, material, and social context relevant to an AI system's operation, but also how those contexts contribute to the system's experiential engagement with the past. Let's first consider situating an AI system within a spatio-temporal framework. Recommendation engines in Amazon, Netflix, or social media feeds do not operate monolithically across all regions and consistently over time. Rather, each transaction alters the algorithm ever so slightly, so that a product that it may recommend one day in one locale for one demographic may not be the same product it recommend recommends a day, a week, or a year later. Each transaction contributes to the increasing historical data upon which the algorithm relies for future transactions, all the while adjusting its epistemic parameters. Bereft of the AI system's source code, historians will need to find creative workarounds by comparing outcomes generated in different locations and or at different times. Comparative analysis may demand scientific precision in their spatiotemporal boundaries by studying quantitatively and qualitatively the byproducts of transactions, such as media viewership, the flow of news and inf information, or consumer behavior, drawing at times from current social science methodologies. The key here is to recognize AI systems as fluid agents that change over time, both in its operation, but also by its own relationship with the data that it processes, influenced by factors too numerous to identify here, but include the type of machine learning at play, system upgrades, and external changes outside the system's control. Besides situating AI systems within space and time, 
historians must also contend with their material and human infrastructure. And here you'll hear echoes of what uh, a lot of my colleagues on this panel have said. Um, AI systems are much more than algorithms operating in a virtual void. They are the material sum of numerous extracted minerals, hardware components beginning with microchips, servers, environmental sensors, fiber optic cables, and expanding to complex technologies such as mobile devices, vehicles, cameras, and a host of other technologies. These technologies in turn function as the building blocks for larger infrastructural networks, such as cloud computing, data repositories, utility grids, communication systems, and satellites. For example, the picture quality of a human subject captured by a surveillance system can determine the accuracy with which it identifies criminal suspects. And the combination of a self-driving car's camera array and steering mechanisms paired with wireless software updates can make the timely difference in identifying potential road hazards. Equally important as the material infrastructure is an AI system's human infrastructure. Working behind the scenes are programmers, marketers, executives, engineers, scientists, content curators, and lawyers, all of whom contribute to a system's functionality. As much as an AI system may respond autonomously to environmental stimuli, an entire community of practitioners influences its maturation. Search engine results are manually adjusted according to public or legal activism. Algorithmic filters for social media news feeds are tweaked when faced with mounting political pressure. Modification is still as much an art as it is a science that requires numerous human-led subjective decisions from the selection of a training data set to how the algorithm weights data. All these contextual elements, spatial, temporal, material, and social, contribute to an AI system's capacity to mirror historians in gathering, organizing, and interpreting data. Which brings us to the critical issue of historical bias. It is well chronicled the many ways in which AI can exacerbate social biases, but I would suggest that we must expand our consideration of bias to include a more scientific understanding of bias that considers, for example, deviations from a system's probabilistic outputs. Bias becomes an interplay of values that inform each other, prompting historians to locate agency with a, within a phalanx of perspectives. In other words, bias must account for the entanglement of human and machinic historical understandings shaped by experience. In their interactions with AI systems, humans introduce attitudes toward AI, knowledge, and experiences that create unpredictable results. We adapt our behaviors to elicit certain responses from the AI system, say to evade a camera's gaze or elicit alterations to a newsfeed through strategic likes and retweets. Each behavioral adjustment by humans triggers an adjustment by the AI system and vice versa, creating a causal loop that deepens over time. So the concept of AI has, as historian, therefore, can serve as a powerful epistemological framework that can pierce the black box veil obscuring human machine relations. Just as historians sift through information in search of evidence, so too does AI. Just as historians situate AI just as historians situate evidence within a contextual framework of actors, time frame, geography, and materiality, so too does AI. In short, historians studying this age of artificial intelligence must address historical biases inherent to and entwined among human and AI agents. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. That was, um, I will jump in now. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Let me go into, okay. Can everyone see this? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo uh, the uh, thank you to Daryl again and the entire AHA team um, for both rounding up this group uh, for this roundtable, but all your work this entire the last several months to make AHA virtual uh, and to continue the conversations in this format. It's been a really exciting and I really want to thank you for all of your hard work, uh, uh, um, particularly given the circumstances of the last year. So thank you. Um, so um, today I'm going to give my take on this question around AI and historical research. And um, we've heard a lot of really great uh, uh, comment, uh, feedback and thoughts and uh, about really the, really the critical side of a lot of these uh, the algorithms and the limits of a lot of the initi 
efforts and being really careful about um, and being cautious about how we use algorithms in AI and the, and the um, and yeah, a lot of those cautions. But today I want to talk a little bit about maybe what's what we could also do and land on maybe a positive note about where we might be able to take the profession profession. And so my uh, comment for today or my provocation is let's remake or let's make and remake AI for historical research. What can we do if we build it for our purposes? What can we, what is possible? And I say that because I think um, we have a lot of opportunities right now. Uh, as Meredith brought up, yes, a lot of things have not are not being preserved and we've got to do a lot of work to do that. I think of Internet Archive, but I also think of people like Ian Milligan and the Archives Unleashed project at the University of Waterloo and other efforts in Europe, like the Media Suite and those efforts uh, within the Claria systems that are really trying to preserve at scale a lot of our digital uh, output, current moment of born digital materials, as well as digitize uh, materials from many different uh, sectors and areas. And we have a lot of res we have a lot of digital sources that we can draw on and bring this critical lens, right? No historian, I think, goes into an archive not thinking about the biases and the and the organization and categorization that has shaped it. That's a kind of fundamental to our training at this point. And so we bring all of that together. And what I think AI can partially do for us is help facilitate access and discovery of these sources, particularly at scale. And by doing that, we can we can also um, look at expand our methods and therefore ways of knowing. So image analysis, text analysis, spatial analysis, these are all ways of knowing that can actually shape how we how we um, analyze our sources and how we um, find them in the first place. And then by doing that, we can broaden the kinds of evidence that count, um, not just the close textual research, but to looking and uh, close uh, reading, but also ways of distant viewing and distant reading or other probabilistic methods that are ways of knowing that we can actually help shape the way we do our evidence. And this gets back to Ben's point. We're not always so great about thinking about method and then making that as, as highlighting it. But if we can do a little bit more of that and think and show some of that, I think it really, we can expand build a more capacious configuration of sources, evidence, and methods in the field. Um, and historians and those in, engaged in historical inquiry have to be, uh, I think, a part of the process of remaking these systems. And so let me draw an example from um, our work at the Distant Viewing Lab. So let's say you're excited about studying visual culture um, in the early 20th century in the US. Um, I know I am. Uh, so one of these things we do a lot is uh, we're so one of the things you might be interested in is um, looking at photography from that period. So a really um, uh, popular and common um, source is what's called the Farm Security Administration Office of War Information Photography Collection held by the Library of Congress. Uh, many look at the same iconic photographs by Dorothea Lange or Walker Evans, but as a part of the collection, it's over 170,000 photographs that are largely understood to depict the American South during the Great Depression. Yet the Library of Congress has not only digitized it, but made an incredible commitment to metadata on these, on these, on these images. And then if we add AI methods such as computer vision to think about visual search and um, ways of seeing through uh, computer vision, what could we actually do? And so one of the things that we've been doing is sort of more traditional research, right? We're writing an article that looks at the different ways of seeing that the different photographers had in order to understand the sort of visual cultures of the New Deal state during the 1930s and 1940s. And we're looking at who they photographed or their politics of representation. And we're using different image, ana uh, image analysis algorithms to do this, different machine learning methods. And this is going to be a part of a sort of classic chapter and um, a book coming out with MIT on distant viewing. But the other thing we can think about doing is merging our different methods from the digital humanities and think about what the digital public humanities could do for us. And so one of the things that we've been doing is we're, um, we blend these methods to say, not only make visual arguments about this collection. So for example, disrupting the idea that this collection is just about the American South, but actually expanding the ideas of space and place and time that were a part of the vision of the New Deal state. And we make that argument partially visually through the um, through mapping, we also can facilitate um, information retrieval and access and discovery through interactive merger of spatial analysis, image analysis, and text analysis. So in this case, what we've done is we've taken the images, you can look at it by space and place, and what we're doing is we're building in the ways of thinking and the ways that we do historical inquiry into the platform itself. 
And one of the things you're about to see is we actually used computer vision for two purposes. One is um, a, it so allows us to see visual tropes in the collection by doing image similarity. So we start to see these visual tropes such as Main Street or if the, a familiar the famous image of migrant mother, it's not the only image of the sort of Madonna figure that gets produced over and over and over again. So we can think about visual cultures of the era. It also serves as a recommender system to move people through the collection in unexpected ways. So particularly for photos that have no metadata, we can actually move people through the collection in ways they haven't seen before. So we can disrupt certain ways that's been categorized and organized. And we can do that by combining these different methods and think of uh, these different methods. Finally, I want to say that um, another thing that we are uh, been thinking about is, you know, that's not just one of the things we could do with AI is actually make software that actually is embedded with some of our commitments. So in this case, we've been building um, the distant viewing toolkit that recharacterizes and recategorizes the output of and retrains different algorithms for features that scholars of the hum certain kinds of humanistic inquiry care are committed to. So for example, uh, facial recognition is turned, um, recategorizes close shot, medium shot, and long shot if you're doing film studies into compositional features like portraiture if you're studying photography. So we're literally recategorizing and retraining the outputs of these algorithms um, and different AI methods so that they can actually be a part of studying uh, and, and literally embedded with uh, the kinds of questions that animate um, our inquiry. And so I show all those examples because I think that one of the exciting parts for the field of history right now is it help AI can actually help us think about expanding our sources, evidence, and methods, as well as our forms of scholarship. We have a very narrow, often narrow configuration of what counts in the field. And if we can think a little bit more creatively and bigger and offer a more capacious configuration of the field, um, I think we could um, see a lot of possibilities for the field moving forward. And I think this comes back to Ben's point earlier as well. Um, otherwise, I think other, other fields are going to really are already running with this. We can look at American studies, media studies, information science, uh, English, and other fields that have really, um, I think, run with a lot of these methods and trying to think really creatively about how they can remake these methods and embed them with, um, with some of the, uh, the questions that animate their areas of inquiry. And so I think there's a real opportunity for us to think um, in new ways. And, and, uh, and I think this brings up a lot of questions about our, how we teach research methods, ideas of credit, uh, intellectual labor, and um, in collaboration that I think are big questions for the field as we move forward. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Uh, that was just tremendous. And, you know, um, at the outset, when Josh and I were talking about this, you know, the idea was what we needed was kind of a primer uh, for historians, frankly, like me, I'm the resident non-expert non here. I'm not an AI expert. Uh, I have a deep interest in this, but I need to learn. And so thank you all for for these offerings. Uh, there's there's a whole lot of learning, I think, happening uh, among our participants here today. Um, so we have about 30 minutes uh, left. So we've got some time for some questions. Um, I do have a question I'd like to pose. We have a question in the chat. I think we've got time uh, for those. And uh, others out there, if you have your questions that you're thinking about, please go ahead and plop those into the chat and we'll be happy to, to work those in. Um, you know, there's just so much here. You could ask really about any of these threads and we could then talk for the next five hours, but uh, we're not gonna be able to do that. But I did wanna pose a question. And again, we're gonna take the, rob the round robin approach uh, and we'll start with Matt uh, on this. But uh, a question that uh, each of you has touched upon in, in some sense, and you know, as Lauren just reminded us that the understanding and excavating bias in the archives is fundamental to the work of historians and it's fundamental to their training as historians. Um, and we know that uh, through a great uh, emerging large body of work, uh, we're just seeing uh, all of the ways that bias is uh, often baked into AI systems through training data and through 
other means. So uh, could each of you speak a little more broadly to how such bias is likely to manifest in the places historical researchers will encounter AI systems? And perhaps, Ben, that even involves some systems that are in operation that we're not even aware of. Um, how will or even how can historical research practices adjust to this reality? What are the sorts of pedagogical tools and practices that are going to be needed that we maybe don't have right now that are going to be needed to address the problem of the black box? Uh, and, and Josh has certainly proposed uh, an approach. Um, um, how are we going to deal with uh, faulty and biased data that we are just going to be encountering on a regular basis? So um, I believe, Matt, you'll, you'll start us off. Great. I mean, it's a huge question, and many of the people here can answer it with much more concrete specificity. I think this is a fundamental question. Um, someone just noted that I'm the only, I think I'm the only historian per se, in a historian department, that is. Uh, in the history department. And I taught in the fall a sort of new last minute uh, methodological class. And part of it was digital methods. And it was a, you know, a, a very light introduction for students, but it was alongside, um, uh, you know, examination of the structures of the, the profession from peer review to uh, tenure review to uh, non academic paths. And it was all part of a, an a theme that's been most active, I think, in digital humanities, which is to look at the infrastructure of our own profession. And so I think uh, a way to conceptualize it is to recognize that the array of concerns that have been so, I think, beautifully echoed by um, yeah, everyone, Meredith and, uh, and, and Ben, um, and in the last presentation, those are all part of our critical competencies. What historians often tend to do is pretend they don't have other critical competencies. That is, there's a little bit too much of, Michel de Certeau actually wrote about how we only talk about the labor of interpretation and we want to, so we self-identify away from the technicalities, whether those technicalities are archival practice or other kinds of things. And I think this is a collection of things and it's gonna take a lot of effort to think about what is critical pedagogy going to be, such as um, a lot of people have thought in critical data studies or as uh, Ben reminds us in, um, in particular in the digital humanities, which has been in a very critical self-reflective mood almost since the moment that it had this kind of, uh, re-emergence uh, some years ago. I could say more, but I'd love to hear what other people have to say. Kate, if you're with us. I am. Um, look, this is such a rich topic and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to note Lauren's point, which is this is certainly a topic that historians think about a lot in terms of existing bias and systems. But certainly, you know, if there's one point I'd add, it's it's in my work in studying bias and AI, which I really sort of began about a decade ago, it became clear to me that the way that often bias is understood or typologized is as sort of failure points, as we sort of see these, these errors in a system and we say here is, is a moment of bias. But rather, I'd like to suggest that we shift that understanding to a deeper sort of structural interpretation of class classification and the work of sort of the classification engines that underlie many machine learning approaches today. And I think what that does is it shifts us away from looking for error and rather sort of looking for the miasma, the way of being, the, the, the very kind of interpretive capacities that AI will push us towards and will implement. The ways in which I guess in this sense, you know, the tools actually shape us as much as we shape tools. So what that might mean then is rather than just looking to the ways in which bias might manifest, we'd instead look to what are the sort of hierarchies of meaning? What are the sort of taxonomies of the way in which information is structured? This, I think, brings us a, a different sort of approach as, as a historical approach, but also in terms of us as, as the inquirers. Um, so in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's a model for self-reflection and for reflexivity in history as much as it is for looking at sort of the failures of particular technical systems. But I'll leave that there and I'd love to hear from others. Uh, Meredith. All right, let me unmute. 
I would say that a really useful frame is put forth by Ruha Benjamin in her book, Race After Technology. Uh, and she gives us the idea that automated decision-making systems discriminate by default. So it's not just about, oh, is the data biased or is the system biased? But it changes the frame entirely to say, yes, it is discriminatory, it is biased, and how is this particular system discriminatory or biased? Uh, one of the things that Kathy O'Neill uh, writes about in uh, her work on the need to audit AI systems is the essential question of uh, for whom does the system fail and how? So for a very long time, we had the perspective that uh, technological systems were more objective or more unbiased than humans and that they were therefore better. And this is an idea that I call techno chauvinism, the idea that technological solutions are superior to others. Uh, instead, what I would argue is that we should use the right tool for the task. And we should not believe in technical systems as infallible. Uh, instead, we should understand them as uh, objects that are constructed by human beings uh, who have many biases and blind spots and failings and who are, uh, who are just fallible. Uh, we should also understand that these systems break, they're very brittle, they're fragile. Uh, and when we start looking at the system to say, okay, the system has problems, this data set has problems, this image recognition technology has problems because it's built on racist technology uh, which is to say the color film technology, which did not uh, show dark skin adequately uh, with clarity until the 1980s. Uh, there's just, there's such a deep structural history of bias that if we start acknowledging that upfront, it makes it easier to see what the problems are in the systems today. Ben, I think you're next. Yeah, sorry, I, I missed my cue all the time. Um, I think that one of the things that historians often underestimate when they're when they're talking about contemporary digital collections and the biases ingrained inside of them is just how susceptible to uh, suggestion a lot of the organizations that put those collections together are, and also the opportunities that historians themselves have to build substantial digital collections, which represent, uh, you know, if still a biased, because every, you know, the, the idea that historians are, the idea that you can create an objective collection is something that exists only for the image net creators, but one that contains a set of biases, which more closely maps on to the sort of things that we want to have. And, and in certain cases, historians actually tend to underestimate the uh, diversity present in some of the more modern scanning projects like the Chronicling America um, uh, digitized newspaper project at the Library of Congress, which because it was done through state humanities councils and was able to be pressured by historians, uh, made a special effort to collect a large number of African-American newspapers where they had been preserved on microfilm and certainly over sampled from the preserved record African-American newspapers compared to other ones. So I think, in terms of addressing the questions around biases and source collections that we work with, the answer is actually pretty simple, which is that historians should be more attentive to not viewing themselves as just passive consumers of data sets created by other people, but seeing it as a fundamental part of the work of history, as, as Matthew put it in his, um, in his essay, The Auxiliary Sciences of History. And you know, if you want to have more different source collections going out there, you just need to find ways to deploy the work that's done inside the historical profession more at the creation of those sorts of archives, which is well within our reach than at um, all of the other wonderful stuff that historians do. Okay. Oh my gosh, this is always, it's always so hard to go at the end of the group. Um, I, I'm, I just wanna say, I'm so thrilled to, to hear uh, you know, Meredith and Kate and, and Benjamin and Matthew all, all talk about the importance of, 
uh, understanding um, the biases inherent to uh, at the collection level, at the data set level. Uh, I'm fully on board with uh, needing to come up with new methodologies in that in that realm. So I don't want to sort of uh, uh, echo so much of what has already been said, but just to, to sort of add uh, a, a bit of a nuance to, to, to that notion, which is to say that we can't sort of disassociate the, the, the machine from machine learning. Um, and, and everyone on the panel and so many scholars understand that machine learning and, and the way it classifies data, images, language, et cetera, um, does it in a way that is completely divorced from the way that we're accustomed to understanding the world, to our own um, way of contextualizing uh, and uh, sort of interacting with the environment. Um, so for example, I, I took um, uh, an example of a microhistory of a car crash uh, that, was, uh, that occurred with a semi-autonomous vehicle and uh, uh, you know, there were investigations around the crash and what was discovered uh, was that the uh, autopilot system, you know, connected to the camera array system did not recognize the barrier um, in which the car crashed. And uh, I would argue that's a, that's a kind of a form of bias as well. And you could, you could certainly pull back and say that the engineers and, and programmers uh, who developed the system um, in a certain way, you know, programmed or uh, the way in which the vehicles are trained uh, to understand their environments. Um, but at the end of the day, it's also a matter of the actual hardware that is um, sensing its environment. And so, uh, so I would just make a plea for um, sort of uh, sort of thinking of this more holistically um, and to to understand to the extent that we can what's going under going on underneath the hood. Um, with the algorithms themselves, how are they classifying, and and to understand that the the developers oftentimes, as I think was mentioned earlier, don't quite understand how they're classified either, and so yeah, we need to kind of take in, take into account that as well. Lauren, feel free to jump right in. Yeah. So I think um, one thing I was thinking about the question around bias and algorithms is. Um, we also, we mentioned that his, the field of history needs method to bring back method, but also we need a lot of theory actually. And that is not always a place that historians are very excited about either. Cause one of the things I was thinking about was, I think it's really interesting that a lot of ways we talk about compute, a lot of our reference to AI here was about ways of seeing. That's John Berger, that's visual culture theory. We, and a lot of the work I'm working on is re-understanding computer vision through visual culture theory, through Berger, Pawlowski, and then if we understand that computer vision is a way of seeing and viewing, i.e. distant viewing, then we can re-understand what we're going looking for and we can completely adjust. We can see, do we like what we're seeing and viewing? And then we can change what we're seeing and viewing. But if we don't have that theory method and historical ways of, under, of, of visual culture that, we can, that are being embedded inside, when we combine them, we can unlock the bias. We can see the bias in new ways and we can reimagine what's possible because if we're, we can create and we can see and unsee in different ways. So I, I think that that's another part of our understanding of bias is that is, um, I can't believe I'm saying this in graduate school, I would have um, been this, not the last, I wouldn't have said, I wanna go back to theory, but I'm back. I'm, 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 I'm really, I'm really excited about theory. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's a historical training in the earlier part. Um, so, um, and then the other thing I wanna add is, uh, well, because I think we have to really understand the bias and perspectives that we are, in, uh, in, that we're baking in because the, the, the as, I have to tell the, uh, the, those in this group, right? The, the stakes can be really high and, and it can be incredibly high. So um, there's, a, there's that. Uh, but the second thing I wanna add about the black box, cause I hear this a lot too, particularly um, in digital humanity circles, but in maybe digital other circles is certain things are black boxes. Like neural networks are, people are really trying to understand how they're making decision making, but other things are actually not black boxes. And I think one of the reasons we default to the black box because we don't have the other experts in the room often and we're not collaborating with those who actually really understand. They have the expertise. They know how those decisions are being made. And if we can work together and we can collaborate, 
And if you write an article and it's dual authored and it doesn't count as half of a publication, but a full publication, right? Then we can actually re we can actually get everyone together and it's going to be at those at those intersections and connections and that kind of I think Venn diagram of knowledge and expertise that some of the most exciting scholarship is going to come together. I think of, you know, Kate mentioned working with Paglin, right? I mean, these are really exciting moments. And it's why at the Distant Beauty Lab, the other co PI, the co director is in the math and computer science department. You know, it's these, it's the bringing together this collaborative ethos uh, uh, that I think actually will help us unlock the black box in new ways. Thanks, Lauren. With tenure and promotion committees, uh, department chairs in our audience, there you go. We've got a great ch chat going on related to these issues as well. Um, we have several uh, questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to pull out one of these, and um, we've got um, just a little more than 10 minutes, so we're going to see how we do here. Um, and actually, it uh, looks like uh, one of those is getting a response from one of our presenters, so thank you. Um, the question is, how are digital technologies such as machine learning altering what Alan New calls the sense of history, our changing understanding of uh, the feel for historicism and even for temporality itself? Matt, we'll start with you. Um, I think that's a you know, I think there's a way that one could imagine that in a kind of abstract sense, as you suggest, of temporalities. Um, and I probably would leave that to some other people to discuss, though I think some of the most interesting work, like Cameron Blevins' work on newspapers um, and the, under, the, the, the understanding of geography changes over time a lot of, uh, is really unusual. I think I would, in answering the question, I would think closely to the kind of work that um, Laura Putnam has, has encouraged us and that Ben was encouraging us to think about is the ways in which new default forms of, of, of understanding the relationship of source is implicitly changing a lot of the ways that we are, um, we imagine ourselves to operate and that we may in, in many ways operate at such a critical, critical philosophical sense, the way in which we imagine time differently, a la Koselleck, um, but also in a very technical located sense of what is it that we practically are able to do. Um, as I said, some, someone was talking about Hathi Trust. I'm like, you're going to take Hathi Trust away from my cold, dead hands after the pandemic because it's been so productive. I, I love that comment, Matt, and I, and I would absolutely plus one it. Um, this is a fantastic question and, and certainly um, something that I've been reflecting on uh, in relation to a formal question around how, how to be reflexive, the ways in which uh, these tools are in fact changing modes of inquiry and changing us. And I'm thinking here, of course, of Ian Hacking's work and, and the idea about the way that the classifications uh, are really engaging in making up people, you know, how are these systems also making up modes of inquiry um, at the same time? I think you're exactly right in terms of the temporalities that we experience. And, and part of this, I think, points also to Meredith's comments around we are left with what is available and how does that also in some ways skew the way in which we can conduct forms of historical inquiry. Um, and to me, this is, is underscores the degree to which this work is extremely difficult. I mean, not only are many of these systems very large and complex and constantly in flux, um, it is all, also in many cases impossible to sort of fully generate them at scale. This idea that the map is not the territory, you can't fully generate the system to see how it might have worked even five years ago, let alone now, if you're looking at something like, say, Google search. Um, these are many types of black boxes, not just thinking about bias, but thinking about the legal black boxes that prevent us from opening up and studying these systems, the forms of supply chain black boxes, where many of these kinds of practices are intentionally occluded from view. So I think in many ways, you know, this question really asks us to pause and say, in what ways are we being remade 
in terms of what we can study as histories because of where the spotlight falls. I think about this in my own work in terms of the fact that so much of my studies of the histories of training data has really been around what's publicly available, yet the giant engines of training data are almost all proprietary and are held as the most protected corporate jewels that will never be seen. So here too, we have to think about, you know, what paths are open to us and how we might think about studying those things that are beyond our reach. It's a fantastic question. So what I'm thinking about right now is a little unformed, but it has to do with the idea that in the past we studied fixed objects. Uh, that you could look at a text that was published by, say, a newspaper on a particular day, and you could understand that as the final word on uh, what this news organization had to say about this particular event at this particular time. And that idea that you study the past as you know, as like a as a fixed object, or you assemble a sense of the past based on fixed objects, is totally exploded in the world where we study software because software changes every single day. It changes every hour, and so uh, Kate just mentioned Google Search. Nobody's ever going to be able to study Google Search as an historical object because it does not exist as a fixed object. And there's no historian who's ever going to have the compute power that Google has. So mega corporations, these big tech companies have outdistanced any current or future scholarly endeavor. I mean, there is no way that an historian is going to be able to have enough research funds or enough computing power to look at uh, the Google search corpus. Uh, people talk about, oh, well, let's use Twitter data, or let's use Facebook data to analyze something in the scholarly realm, which is really great. But then when you actually realize how much data we're talking about, you can't handle it. People talk about the Twitter garden hose and the fire hose. So the Twitter API gets you a garden hose sized I stream and you can analyze that and you can run analytics on it and you can do stuff and it's totally manageable, but it's actually only a small slice. The actual Twitter fire hose is called that because it is a fire hose of information and it will blow through all of the memory that you have available in instance. And so it's just, it's unwieldy. Uh, so I think this is another way that it's kind of unreasonable to expect uh, you know, current or future historians to be able to look at software as an historical artifact because you're only ever really going to get a snapshot and you're only going to get a tiny piece of it. Um, one really small piece of Michael's question that I think about a lot is, um, has to do with the way that most machine learning models are inherently synchronic and diachronic complications in machine learning models are usually some sort of like fillip or wheel on top of it. Like there are computer scientists who have done things, various different attempts to make things like even like simple word embedding models into diachronic things that can show change over time. Um, but first, those don't fit easily into the mechanism of the embedding space because like you need to have lots of training examples and to have lots of training examples in a hundred different individual years like starts to blow through the memory that exists on the GPU cards that your um, uh, employer provides for you. And second, when you try to turn something into a diachronic representation, it requires a model of time, which I'm not sure is one that is necessarily that sympathetic to historians, which is that time is a sort of linear thing that you can predict on. Um, if you look at the ways that I, I recently did a lit review on, on predictions of like, you know, dating photographs and dating books and various things like that in, in, in machine learning journals. And one of the things people are often tempted to do is to try to do it as a, as a linear regression problem in which, you know, time is just sort of an undifferentiated flat linear 
thing, which um, I don't know, I always have undergraduates read Joseph Priestley on timelines, but I think, I think what these things may tend to do sort of culturally in the kind of phenomenological way that I think Michael Kramer's asking about is to, um, is to privilege a more linear continuous notion of time rather than, you know, epistemic shifts that are fracturing and breaking and various other like models of how temporal changes happen. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, just to kind of piggyback on a little bit of of, of what Ben was saying, and, and uh, I, I'm in I'm in whole wholeheartedly wholeheartedly in agreement with Michael that that these um, that these AI systems, you know, are uh, fundamentally changing how we engage with the past, and um, you know, all you have to do is is again look at um, where people are getting their information, getting their news. Uh, you know, they're getting their understanding of the past from, in many cases, these types of systems. And so I think one way we can look at these systems is a, is a you know, is a kind of mechanism by which um, it gathers data in a certain context and then through the algorithmic processes recontextualizes that data um, and spits out an output in the ways that it's uh, intended to function. And I think, uh, it, you can kind of see this manifested in the kind of sub um, field of uh, explainable AI. And I think this is where there's a, a real opportunity for historians to kind of um, uh, make their voice heard. Um, so explainable AI is, uh, are the engineers and programmers and so forth trying to figure out or explain or interpret what their systems that they've just created are actually doing. <laughs> That's a very simplistic way, but um, I think you know they bring uh, their own understanding of what context is, of what interpretability is. Uh, so I, you know, I'll just make a plea because uh, I know we're short on time. That I think historians, of course, can bring their own uh, uh, conceptions and uh, epistemologies to the table, um, and I think that will um, help us to understand how these systems are historicizing or engaging the past uh, better. So. We, we started a couple of minutes late, so uh, we're going to fudge a little bit. And uh, so we, we definitely want to hear from Lauren before we wrap up. Sure, I'll just quickly build off uh, Josh's point of, that, of us getting more involved in, in all these systems and being a part of them. Um, I think it's I think this could be also a very exciting time for historians. And if we can um, think critically about training and um, how we our credit systems and our TNP processes and all the incentives and all of our, our structurally about the institutions of history and then think about how we um, what we imagine for the field in the future and get involved with um, other uh, inter and more interdisciplinary collaborations and we could really build something and be a part of some really exciting work and I We'll give a quick example. Um, I'm blanking, I apologize, I can't remember the group's name, but a computer science group at University of UMass Amherst reached out to a series of historians because they're trying to build a search system for newspapers specifically for historians. And my question is, that's awesome. It was funded by the NSF, but why aren't historians co-PIs on this? Why aren't we also at the table? Why are we just the subject or the observer and not at a part of the of that funding with them and at, at literally building and collaborating on that project from the beginning and i i think those are the opportunities and the spaces that we should be um we should be a part of um because it can uh well i think we have there's a lot that's possible so as you can probably see i'm an eternal optimist about what we can do so uh, i'll end on that well, thank you, Lauren. I will just give a plus two to the idea of historians engaging themselves uh, much more fully in uh, learning about the work of all my co-panelists uh, as, a, as a place to begin. And uh, thank you all for this wonderful discussion. I think this has been a wonderful primer for those who are newly initiated uh, to this discussion. Uh, and it's, it's just been fabulous. And again, after all these months of not seeing each other, it just really is wonderful to see your faces. Um, I'm going to say thank you to all of our audience 
who joined us and 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 I'm very sorry that we were not able to get there are two more questions in the queue and we were not able to get to those so uh, I'm very sorry for that. Um, uh, but I will now turn it back over to our AHA colleagues and say thank you all again uh, for joining us and uh, we look forward to being in touch soon. Thank you again to our uh, generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. And finally, a special thanks to our panelists today. Have a great day. Thank you.